Okay, so we said last week that we sing out the table of contents, which is something which is very strange. We don't normally do that. But we do that here because Passover is all about growth. And what we want to do is celebrate our growth. Anyone willing to read? We're going through the Haggadah text, and we are going to be reading some of it. Uh, here is... Who is? Mitan, would, would like to? Uh, Jack, reading in Hebrew or in English? Let's do it. Uh, Hebrew yeah. or English, Jack? Okay, do the English. Halachma. Oh, oh, man, this keeps going off. Uh, okay. This is the bread of destitution. So we're right now in the section of uh, Magid, which is where we tell the story. And this is the mitzvah, the mitzvah of the Torah, to tell the story to our children, to ourselves, of Egypt. Okay? And um, there's meant to be a point of saying this story, even though I do this every single year. But this time, we are really meant to have a message because every year, things change, right? Every year, circumstances change. Like this year, when we say, why is this night different to all other nights? I hope you're going to think about something that's different this night on Passover of 2020 that's different than 2019, for instance, being under quarantine, right? So um, the idea of uh, reading this again and again and again is because every year things are situation changes and we relive the experience with a new message for us personally, for ourselves. Okay, so that's, that's one of the things that we have to do. And the other aspect is because by reliving the story, we already mentioned in the past, I come three things. I come more merciful. I come more spiritual because I'm more grateful. I'm more free from physical slavery. And I also come um, more connected to Hashem for the fact that I recognize that he's involved in me at every minute. He's not just involved in creating the universe, but he's involved in taking me out of my own personal Egypt. Okay, so those are the three uh, aspects that I need to grow in that we've been speaking about till now, okay? So this is uh, the beginning, which is the aspect of uh, Magid, which is saying the story. By the way, before we do Magid, oops, before we actually do Magid, uh, there is uh, something called yachatz. Does anyone know what yachatz is? Yachatz. Anyone here know what yachatz is? Okay, so this is the order that we're going to be doing the Passover. And uh, when you have your machzor, when you have your book on the night of Passover, it's going to tell you the list of all the things that we're meant to be doing. And uh, the first is Kadesh, which is Kiddush. The second is Urchat, which is washing, washing our hands. Then we do the Karpas, which is dipping the vegetable. We spoke about all this last week. We do the vegetable in the, in the salt water to feel the tears, feel the emotion, feel the pain. Then we do Yachatz, which is breaking of the matzah. Okay? We split the matzah in half, right? Anyone here with me? Everyone listening? Maybe not. Okay, so uh, the idea is that we split the matzah into two and we take the big piece. Who remembers this? We split the matzah. What do we do with it? You hide it. Right, we hide it. And who for? The middle matzah. The we can see yeah, the light. For the kids. For it's the kids, fine. exactly. It's and why? for the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why do we do that? Anyone remember? It's for, it's for Joseph. Because you can't finish the Seder without it. Right, you need to have it. But why do we cut it from the middle? What's, what's the point of hiding it from the kids? So you can't, you, you're meant to make that the last food that you eat, yes? Because you want to keep the kids awake, right? The whole point of this uh, story is to educate your children. So you want to keep the kids awake. And for that reason, we hide the big piece that we split not the small piece. What do you think that teaches a child when he's 
take a big piece of something which is valuable to you and you put that away. And you say, okay, we're going to eat that later. What's good about teaching a child to wait for things? Why is that good? Teaches them delayed gratification. Exactly. Exactly. And that is a very powerful message because remember, leaving Egypt is not just about leaving Egypt 3,331 years ago, 332 years ago. It's about leaving our Egypt this year. It's about leaving our Egypt ourselves. Okay. And we are also somewhat enslaved to our own Egypt, which is our physical desires, our uh, lack of gratitude, our lack of humility, right? We're all in our own Egypt. So what we want to do is have that freedom. And one of the messages that we're teaching ourselves as well as the children is that, hey, the difference between spiritual freedom and what people think is physical freedom, which is comfort, right, is immediate gratification versus short-lived gratification, uh, long-term gratification, right? So that is the difference, and that's what we're teaching that child. Rabbi, I have a question real quick. Yes. Yes, Um, sure. If you have a Seder with only adults, do you hide the apikomen? Yes. Everything you do with children, you do it with yourself, even if you're alone in the Seder night. Even if you're alone and you're in the midst of to tell the story, you still tell the story to yourself. Good question. And the answer is yes, because this, I am the child. I have to treat, treat myself as a child as well. It's true that it's about passing on our message to our, further, to our generations on, but it's also about me passing it to myself because I need to educate myself. And here is a very powerful message of hiding the Afrikoman, which is um, that, you know, true freedom is not having the pleasures immediately, but saving them for long term. That's happiness as well. Ha- happiness is gained when you achieve something over the long term, right? If you get 10 bucks and you just spend it straight away, you can't enjoy it as much as if you save it for a special moment, right? And then you, you gather much more money. And then you use it, right? So the longer you have something, uh, the longer term something lives, the more spiritual it is. The more short term something lives, the less spiritual it is. A physical relationship is very short lived, right? If you think about the physical aspect of relationship. How, how long lived is a physical relationship? Only the time that you're physical. The minute you stop being physical, that's it. The relationship's over. But a spiritual relationship, meaning even in a marriage, right, or a, in a spouse, right, in a real, I'm talking about in this world, not just between us and God, but with people, a, a more spiritual inclined type of relationship is long term. A physical inclined relationship is very short lived. And that's, that's really the message here of splitting that bread. And uh, obviously, it's also to do with the splitting of the sea. And the, and the, main ask, the main reason is because it's the poor man's bread. This is meant to remind us of the poverty that we lived in. And normally every Shabbat, how many chalot do we have taken out? Two. Right, on Shabbat we normally have two chalot. So this time we also have two. We have an extra one, that's called the extra bracha. That's, that's for later. But we also have those two. But we don't want to have two whole ones. Normally during the year, we have two whole pieces of bread. This time, we're going to have one whole piece and one half, or half a piece. And the reason we want to have half a piece is because we're living in poverty. A poor person never has a whole piece. He's always has, he has to share that piece. He has a chicken. He, he shares the piece of chicken with everybody else. He has one, pe- one bit of rice. You know, he shares that plate with everybody else. So it's all about sharing. By the way, it's another thought that you should understand is that somebody who is in a state of poverty understands the need of somebody else who's in poverty. That makes sense. It's logical to us. If somebody's on drugs, 
and they overcome and they, they, they leave their addiction, they can help somebody else who's on drugs much more than anybody else. True? Very true. Right? So if, you are, if you're in a state of poverty, you actually understand people that are in poverty much more than anybody else. And um, that's, that's the way that they live. The way that the poor live is that they're always sharing. They're always thinking of the people around them because that's how they survive. And uh, they know that pain. And therefore, they have a much more, um, a stronger sense of compassion because of their, part, their state that they're in. So uh, that's also another aspect, meaning when we relive that poverty, when we relive that slavery, we are meant to actually have within us that uh, compassion as well. Okay, I want to move on and go into the actual um, Haggadah, which is Magid, which is the story that we're meant to teach. Okay, so Eitan, you read us, Halach Ma'anya. This is the poor person's bread, which is how the Haggadah actually starts. Eitan, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay so, so go for it. This is the bread of destitution that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Anyone who is famished should come and eat. Anyone who is in need should come and partake of the Pesach sacrifice. Now we are here. Next year we will be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves. Next year we will be free people. Okay, so here's a number of questions we have to answer. First is, what's with the redundancy? It's always a question in Judaism. What's with the redundancy? Okay, so here goes the redundancy. Uh, Anyone who is famished should come and eat, and anyone who is in need should come and partake in the Pesach sacrifice, in the meal of the Paschal meat that we're going to have, the lamb. Okay? So we have two things here. We have anyone who's in need, anyone who's hungry should come and eat, and anyone who's in need should partake in the Pesach sacrifice. Anyone know an answer to that? Why do we need that redundancy? Don't search on Google. So the question is, why does it say come and eat and partake in the sacrifice? The sacrifice. Why anyone who's hungry, it says anyone who's hungry should come and eat. And anyone who's in need should join us in this Pesach offering. Let's just look at the Hebrew a second. Look at the Hebrew. Uh, yeah, you know, the Pesach offering something different. What is the Pesach? Anyone who's needy should come and eat. And uh, anyone, anyone who's hungry should come and eat. And anyone who's in need should come and do the Pas Passover with us. So there's two wordings here of basically the same thing. Just say either anyone who's hungry should come and eat or say anyone who's in need should come and do the Passover with us. What's with that redundancy that goes on there? Anyone who's famished should come and eat. Anyone who's in need should come and partake in the Pesach sacrifice. Can you see that redundancy? What's the Pesach sacrifice? The Pesach sacrifice was in the times of the temple where we would have a, a lamb, we would have meat, and we'd have to take a whole, literally a whole lamb and share it. The point was it was so big and we had to have eaten it all that night. Nothing was to be left over. And the point was it's so big you couldn't eat it alone. You have to share it with others. The idea of that is, is to teach me that uh, when I remember my slavery that I went through, I am now more compassionate. This is what I am. Okay? So I come more compassionate because I remember what I went through when I was a slave. And um, therefore, I have to share my food with everybody. I need to be partake, allowing others to come in, allow the needy to come in, share my food with those that are poor. Okay, so that's the underlying message of Passover in general. If you look at the story of Passover, right now, we're not even starting with the story of Passover. Straight away, we talk about the, the matzah that's in front of us. We're talking about the Paschal lamb. Today, we don't have the Paschal lamb. So the matzah that we have on the plate represents the Afrikoman that we just split. That, that piece of matzah that we split represents 
the Paschal lamb that we used to have. Today, we celebrate it with the matzah instead. Okay? But that's what it represents. So the question in, in general is, why are we saying this twice? And the answer is, there's two types of people that are hungry. Anyone know which types? There's one's someone that's, one's one physical and one's spiritual. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's the language here. Anyone who is famished should come and eat. What do you think Sorry, that is? Uh, what do you think that is? Famished. What do you think that is? I'm always physically hungry. Okay, there you go. So you're always hungry. And that's famished, right? You're always famished. Okay, I hope not. But um, someone who is famished means physically hungry should come and eat. And then it says anyone who's in need. What's need? That's much more of a spiritual thing. And I think today, in our day and age, people are not necessarily famished as much as we understand that there are hungry people, you know, in LA on the streets, there are people that are uh, homeless and so on. But at the end of the day, there are thousands and thousands and thousands more who are spiritually, or not just spiritually, but mentally challenged. They have so much and they are also in need. They need help. They need, they need help in their situation spiritually because they've just been, uh, been given that immediate gratification all the time, instant gratification all the time, and pursuing that world of comfort. There's nothing more to life besides for my comfort than eventually, is that what I'm living for? So there are many people that are in need. I think much more we think of all the people that are physically hungry and famished, but we don't realize that there's a spiritual need that's much greater than the physical need. It's true, there are people that are poor, we need to help them, but there's thousands and thousands more people that are they're, they're eating, they have food on their fridge, but they're mentally poor. I mean, someone who comes to a state where he commits suicide, thousands of people are doing this, right? Where they quit living is way worse, I believe, and someone can tell me if they argue, way worse than being homeless, right? The fact that you choose or you've come to a state where life is so bad because the homeless person doesn't give up on life. He still wants to live. Still running around looking for ways to make money and wants to live. But the, the person that's got everything and, and doesn't want to live, his state has come so bad that they don't want to live anymore. That's, that's even worse. So uh, anyone who's in need should come and partake in the Paschal lamb in the in the pesach sacrifice now that's very interesting what do you do with the pesach sacrifice you eat it you eat it right so you eat the food so that's strange because they're both telling me go and eat the first one's saying go and eat and the second one's also saying go and eat right the first guy who's physically hungry he's told come and eat and I understand that part because he's physically hungry. But the second person who's in need should come and partake in the Paschal sacrifice, partake in the food. Why should he eat? How does that help him spiritually? Ah, it's late at night, I guess. Enlighten us, Rabbi. So Ooh. when somebody... When somebody Obviously, right, it doesn't say should partake in the Paschal meal. It doesn't say partake in the Paschal lamb. It says the sacrifice, the message of the Paschal sacrifice. That's what, it, that's what it means. It's talking about the message here. What's the message of Pesach? They should partake in the message of Pesach, which means recognize that, one, God is involved in your life. Two, Recognize that uh, you need to be out there giving more. If you're only taking, then maybe that's why you're in need, because that's what Passover is all about. It's about having compassion, right? So how to how you come more spiritually satisfied? If you come more of a bal chesed, a person of kindness, of giving, godly like, that's how you become 
somebody who's fulfilled by the message of Passover. And also um, uh, between you and Hashem, by recognizing uh, that as well. And, this, and the third thing is obviously the freedom of your own physical slavery. Free yourself from your instant gratification. Don't be a slave to your physical desires because that too is what Egypt represents. That too is what slavery represents, being enslaved to my physical desires. Okay, so those are the, that is the uh, idea here. Let's move on a bit. Um, there is a redundancy as well in the second, second tenth sentence. Now we are here, next, next year we will be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves, next year we will be free people. Kind of seems like the same thing, right? It also seems like a redundancy. Does anyone have a thought about that? One is literal and one is metaphorical. Like uh, we're here literally, we could be in the land literally, but we're also metaphorically slaves and we could be free people. So good. So the slavery and the freedom. And, and Dan, just get Dan, just one second. Just explaining what Eitan's saying. So the slavery and the freedom part represents our own personal slavery because we're not slaves at all. We're not now slaves in Egypt. No one's in Egypt anymore. So it means our own personal personal slavery to our um, physical desires. It's when I can't turn away from my things that I shouldn't be doing, right? And and that's more uh, theoretical. And the first thing is physically, we want to be in the land of Israel. That is a wish for the Jewish people. Yes, Dan, what were you going to say? I'm just saying, like I don't. In the last example, the two things you were saying were the same, were actually the same. And in this instance, they're completely different. True. Right. One is uh, like, I'm here and I want to be there location-wise. The other is, I'm a slave and I want to be free, which has nothing to do with location at all. Right. So, so you're basically saying it's not even a redundancy. It's obvious that there's two different things. Yeah. So I think by... By starting with the assumption that they are the same, I think maybe you know something we don't know. Like <laughs> you say, two things are actually the same symbolically, so we're skipping step one, right? Because like there's right. nothing literally. True. Maybe I didn't uh, explain enough, but the ultimate freedom would be, yep. according to Judaism. That. Sorry, Danya. I said you're too advanced. You have to remember how far behind we are. No, no, okay, okay. So the ultimate freedom should be, right, according to Judaism, when we are um, completely in connection to God, okay? And anything out of that is somewhat us being enslaved. So us not being in the land of Israel, us not being fully uh, committed to how it was when we had the temple, means that we are somewhat lacking. Okay? Okay. Maybe someone should go and mute there. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Okay. So, um, so that was that, that thought. I just wanted to... Uh, also mention, oh, what, is my screen being shared right now? It now. stopped. No. Stopped? Yeah, like 10 seconds ago. Okay, one second. Uh, we don't have much time. We, we do need to... Um, one second. Here we go. We need to cover some ground because next week is already Passover and we're, we're going to be, oops, okay. we're going to be at it. Okay, so let's go to the next thing. So by the way, the, the answer to that question of this year we're in, in here, next year we'll be in the land of Israel is, look, even as slaves, I'd rather be there. Even as it's somewhat subjugated to the physical, I'd rather be there. That is the, the first statement. And the second statement is, uh, this year we want to be, we are slaves. Next year we will be free 
people because even those that are in Israel living there right now are not fully in a spiritual state uh, that we as people could be, which is the time of Mashiach, which is what we hope for. Okay, so that's really the uh, message here of Halach uh, Ma'anya. I want to be free. I want to be ultimately free, which is to be connected to Hashem. Remember, the Jews left Egypt, and where were they? Where did they go out to? They went running. Why did they rush? They were free. If you're free, what's the rush? Why were they such a rush to get out? You couldn't have some time to break bake bread. You had to run out. You didn't have time to bake the bread. It was no time. Come on. What's the rush? Ever since, by the way, the Jews have always been in a rush. Ever since leaving Egypt. So what's the rush? Why were we such a rush? And the answer is because we were rushing from one slavery to a new type of slavery. Not that it's a slavery, but as a, a responsibility and a connection, which is to God. That's why, by the way, when we finish Shema and we say, uh, we mention the leaving of Egypt, immediately we're meant to go into the silent prayer. Silent prayer is very much connected to the prayer before that, which is talking about Ga'al Yisrael, the redemption of the Jewish people. And at that point, a person's not meant to talk at all. And you're meant to immediately jump into the silent prayer. The reason for that is because we're meant to go from the slavery of Egypt and immediately enter the serving of Hashem in the silent prayer. The idea of that is, is because just because you're free from Egypt doesn't mean you're really free. Okay? People today always speak about freedom. We have freedom to do this, freedom, free, free rights, free, free, free. We're all free. We should be free, free speech, free this, free that. But what do you do with your freedom? Okay, now that you're free, you run home to watch Netflix? Is that freedom? Okay, so that's the question of what is freedom? Yes, you're free from enslavement. You're free from oppression. You're free from all these types of things. But now what are you doing with that freedom? What are you free to do? And Judaism never forgot that part. Because true freedom means when I, yes, I have free will, but true freedom means when I choose the right choice in my free will. You have to understand, if I have a, a choice, free will, and I have a choice between good and bad, we understand when I make the bad choice, I'm not free. It's true, I'm acting on free will, but when I make the bad choice, I'm not free. I'm enslaved to my desires. So the only time I get true freedom is when I make the right choice of the cho two choices I have. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Very important because uh, we think of freedom is either a choice between good over bad. And we have to think a stage ahead. No, real freedom is when you choose the right choice and you ignore the bad. That's when, uh, that's when the freedom is achieved. Freedom is not achieved just because you can choose between good and bad. Freedom is achieved only when you choose the good. Well, in, in a sense, it's, like, it's not like choosing the right thing is what makes you free, but if you were free, then you would make the right choice. Right? Exactly. Okay. Right. If, you're free, if you're free, you'd make the right choice. Right. And, like, uh, and what would that be? To, to do the right thing. I mean, like, it's like that uh, would you know, give when, we were, you we were, when we were learning yesterday, and if you remember, I'd mentioned like it's like uh, what you taught us with uh, with Adam when he was uh, when he was just in the spiritual before you know coming into the physical world. All of his actions were perfectly in tune with what his spiritual self would have wanted. You know, like he would have been disgusted by you know McDonald's. For example, like he would have only wanted healthy things. And then if um, so, like for him to be in the physical world is to have the, the temptations that actually cut away from what, you know, is in accord with what's actually right and free. Exactly. So making that right choice is a new definition of freedom. Uh, let's call it that way. OK. And it's just making that right choice is it. And it gives you a new definition of what freedom is. Um, put, right, right, yeah. 
I mean, put it this way. There's two definitions of freedom. There's free will, and there's the freedom of not being enslaved to, uh, to my desires, okay? There's free will, that's true. And then the next stage is the freedom of making the right choice. Because I feel so freed right now after I made that right choice. And so that's called also freedom. There's free will, and then there's freedom by making the right choice. Two types of freedom. Um, and they need, to be, they need to be understood as two different things. Okay, so that's, that's really uh, what, what you were saying and what's so important to understand it. Okay, let's move on. There are four questions, okay? This year, I was thinking Abraham's going to know it well, but he doesn't know it too well because he, uh, he doesn't have school. So we're trying and teaching him, and he's learning, but that, by the time he's going to get to Passover night, it's not going to be a novel thing to me. It's going to be like, oh, I already taught you this. But even so, every time he sings it, it's awesome. So, um, so here goes the song, What does that mean? Why is this night different than all other nights? Yes. And here's the big question. Okay, because there's, there's, we, we know that there's four questions here, right? This is what it's about. It's about the four questions. But how many questions are there? How many questions are there really? Let's go through it, okay? Five. Eighteen. Oh, Eighteen. It's five. Okay, how do we have five? Let's see, let's see the English. Seven. Who wants to read the English? I, I got could. You. Oh, okay, no. Gabe. Um, Molly or Gabe, one of you. All right, I'll go. I vote Molly. Oh, oh it wasn't Molly? Oh. No, 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 Gabe. Gabe can do it. Gabe can do it. Fine. Okay. All right. What, differenti what differentiates this night from all other nights? All other gonna, nights wait, whenever you see a question, wait, yeah. Gabe, whenever you see a question, count. Okay. When I, whenever I see a question, do what? Count. Oh, count. Okay. What, differenti what differentiates this night from all other nights? One. Okay, on all other nights, we eat chametz and matzah. This night, only matzah. That's two. On all other nights, we eat vegetables. Tonight, only maror. On all other nights, we don't dip our food even once. Wait, by the uh, way, it's, it's, it's unfair because there was a question mark. Yeah, maror, maror is technically three. Okay. Right. Okay. On all other nights, we don't dip our food even one time. Tonight, we dip it twice. That's four. On all other nights, we eat either sitting or reclining. Tonight, we all recline. That's five. Okay, so you understand those five questions. Anyone else agree? I thought those are the answers to the question. Oh, don't you think it's one question with four answers? Right, what's the difference between this night and all the other nights? And then there's four answers. And all other nights we eat chametz and matzah. This night we only eat matzah. On all the nights we eat other vegetables. Tonight we only eat maro. And all other nights we, only, we don't dip our food even one time. Tonight we dip it twice. And all other nights we eat either sitting or reclining. Tonight we all recline. Doesn't it look like four answers to one question? What do you guys yes. think? I agree with that. That was, that, was a, that was tricky, Rabbi. You got it. <laughs> well, it's tricky because there's a question mark there. I didn't write this uh, translation. Lost in translation. But in a way, is it really an answer? Is it answering the question? Well, you could pose uh, more is. questions to each of those answers. So, so what are you saying, yeah. Dan? It's an answer, which is another question? Those are yes. answers. Those are answers. But like the question is, OK. Why? Why only Why matzah? You could ask each of those. So each of those is a question you're saying, because each one leaves you with a why. Well, yeah, only if you don't know. It's not a question, but it, you could ask a question of it. Right. It's right? not like, a question. Every, if, if being able to ask why makes something a question, then everything's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Until God has the answer. <laughs> well, exactly. Like, oh, oh, so that's exactly what I wanted to get to. Which is, but it, it also yes. it helps the question as well. Like on this, 
so it's one it's giving like examples so it's not a question it's just giving examples so so you're saying it's four examples to one big question which yeah. is why is this night on all of the nights we eat why is this night different on all of the nights we come in and my and matzah this night only matzah okay on all other nights we eat vegetables tonight only maror that makes it different so it answers it does answer the question so it answers but it also could be that it's asking uh it's part of the big question which is what why is this night different than all of the nights on all of the nights we eat chametz and matzah this night we only eat matzah hey this is different this night is different so it's, it's part of the question because. If you think about the spirit of the original question, sorry, Julia, you want to go? You go. No? Okay. It supports uh, the original question. If, sorry, if you what, wanted, Julia, what did you say? It supports the original question. So saying. Good. It could you, also support the original question. You hear that, Eitan and Dan? It also supports the original question. Of course. But like, when you think of the spirit of the question, what differentiates this night from all other nights? There's no way it's supposed to be just a list of the actual physical differences, right? Like, it's obviously a deeper question. Right. You know, which, which is what I makes the... Yeah. I which agree. is why it's called the four questions, because there's no way it, this is like a fact sheet, you know, like... Oh, I got it. Jews answer questions with another question. <laughs> there you go. So here's, here's, here's some thoughts for you to, to live up, uh, think about. First of all, if you look at the Hebrew, okay, so the Hebrew, it says, Ma nishtana halayla hazeh. Not, Lama shune halayla hazeh mikon halayla. It's not Lama. Lama is why. Ma means? What? What? So what, what makes or, this thing different than all other nights? Wait, or... It also means in the Torah, it means how. Ma also means how. How do I know that? When Jacob was in, um, this is brought in a number of places, but uh, when Jacob was on his, on his way, he was running away from Esau, his brother, and he went to fall asleep, uh, and he realized he had a dream, and he realized he was in Temple Mount, in the holiest place of the world. He wakes up, and he says, how awesome is this place? Okay, he says, how, ma, how, how awesome is this place? So how is this night different? And then the, the, uh, the Haggadah continues and says, well, it's different because all other nights we have chametz and matzah. Tonight we only have matzah. All of the nights, right? So it's really the first point of why is this night different than all of the nights really should be translated as how is this night different than all of the nights? And then it's the four points or the four questions. So those really are four questions, okay? It's true. If you look at it as ma, then it's really four answers to the original question. But if you look at it as how, if you look at it as how, then really... Those four answers could be four questions as well, understood as four different questions. Okay? Sounds good? Or not so good? Sounds good, Dan. You're good. Okay. Okay. So um, let's let's move on because I want I want to show you some more. We don't have much time. It's almost 9:30. Um, let's move on and see something else <coughs> so we say you know how, why is this night different and then we talk about all the differences each one of them is extremely deep and the question is when we say on all of the nights we eat other vegetables tonight we only eat maror is that true do we only eat the vegetable of maror is that the only vegetable no. we eat on the night of passover no if right, dinner, we eat many vegetables if your dinner is just the Seder plate, then yes. Yeah, well, you're meant to have a Shulchan Aruch. When, when one of the 15 stages of the night of Passover is to have a set table, but to have a beautiful meal. That's one of the requirements of this night. So you're meant to have a meal and you should have vegetables. If you don't have vegetables, then you're eating just 
uh, matzah and maybe some uh, chicken, right? And if you're vegetarian, you're, you're stuck. So what are you going to do? You have to have vegetables, right? So there's many vegetables. And what about right at the beginning of the meal, we also have a vegetable. Do you know which vegetable we have right even before this? Before the Haggadah, we also have another vegetable. Does anyone know what it is? It's on the Seder plate. Celery. Yeah, the celery. Right? Or, or they, right? Some people use, uh, what's it called? Parsley, where you dip it in salt water. Remember? And we dip it twice. And we actually mentioned this in the Manish Tana. So there's many vegetables that we have. So how can it be that it says on all of the nights we eat other vegetables the night we only eat maror? Not true. We eat many vegetables. The answer, I mean, there's so much depth in the whole thing. The, the question is really, why do we even think or contemplate of the reasoning in our food? When do you think of food when you eat it? Normally you eat food, you say, oh, this tastes good, it's sweet, it's bitter, it's, it's sour, it's sharp, it's delicious, it's savory, right? You say that, but you don't take a purpose out of it. You, can, you say, this sweetness, this is going to remind me of all my sweetness. This bitterness reminds me, why are we taking a significance in the taste, right? And that's the question. That's brought down, I have it here. One Miyuchas Lerashi, one of the commentaries that Rashi gives, he says on all the other nights, whenever we eat things, we don't, you know, you eat lettuce, you don't think, oh, this is bitter, or oh, this has a, you know, you just eat it. You don't think or contemplate on the significance of the bitterness of the meal. And that's something we do tonight, right? We want to feel the marrow, we want to feel the tears, we want to feel. So there's this environment of wanting to feel a certain taste uh, to, to really feel the night of passing. So that's really the question here. And, and so on. There's many questions, but I do want to um, just finish off with uh, the four. So the answer, the answer that the Haggadah says is the answer that it gives. We were slaves to Pharaoh in the lands of Egypt. And Hashem took us out from there with a strong hand an outstretched arm, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the answer. The next thing, avadim hayinu, avadim hayinu. Right, so that part is the answer to the four questions. Okay, but uh, I want to jump um, to quickly, oh, it's 9.32 already, she has to give her class. So I want to jump quickly to the four sons. Okay, what are the four sons? Does anyone remember who the four sons are? One is wicked, one is simple, one is wise, and one is... Here you go. Uh, corresponding to four sons did the Torah speak. One who is wise, one who is evil, evil. one who is innocent, or wicked, innocent, and one who doesn't know how to ask. Here's a big question. It says, one child... By the way, it doesn't actually say in the Torah straight out, this child is wicked, this child is wise, but it says four different times, uh, if your child will ask, and it says it in four different ways. One time the child will ask with details, the other time the child asks with little detail, with little concern, okay? And the rabbis explained it into the four types of children that exist, okay? Now, here goes the big question. First of all, just, just a thought. Okay, so there's these four kids. Why is, what's the opposite of evil? What's the opposite of an evil person? Good. Kind Good. person. A righteous child, right? They've got a wicked, a wicked person. You've got a righteous person. But what's the opposite here? It says one who is wise, one who is evil. One who is innocent and one who doesn't know to ask. What's the opposite of What's the opposite of the wicked child? The wise. The wise one. It shouldn't be. It should say one who is righteous. That's what it should have said. It should have said one who is righteous, one who is wicked, one who is simple, innocent, and one who does not. Why does it say one who is wise and one who is wicked? It should have said one who is righteous and one who is wicked. 
Does anyone, does anyone get that? Well, righteousness only comes with wisdom. Right. And what is wisdom? It's knowing the right thing from the wrong. True. Uh, but you can have some people that know but don't act on it. You know, so you might say, okay, a wise person, someone who acts on it. A wise person says, I want to learn from everyone. Okay, so that's the righteous child that we have because the child here wants to learn. And that's how, it, that's how a person should be, that's how everyone should be. We should consider ourselves as a Talmid Chacham, a person that's always learning, not as a tzaddik, not as a righteous person, but always a person that wants to learn from others. Okay, that's who a, a, a wise person is. What's finally, I'll finish off with this. There's a, another point here, which is that it doesn't go in the right order. Okay, the rasha should not be after the chacham. It's not in the right order. The rasha came way after, in the order of the Torah that is brought down, you do not have the, the rasha, the wicked child, Second becomes almost last. Okay, so he sh it's really in the wrong order. Why is it first the wise kid, then the wrong kid, the evil kid? He should not be the second child. He should be the fourth child because he came much later in the order of the Torah. And the answer that's given here is because the wise child and the wicked child are both smart. The, the wicked child's also a smart kid. And it wants to put them on the same level. And that's a very powerful thing that we need to know. That even though if you see somebody who's active, a child who's, who seems to be a badly behaved child, know that that child has greater potential than anybody else. That's a very wise child. That's the child that's like the Chacham. They're on the same level. There's some people that are way worse than the naughty child. You know what they are? They're the apathetic people, the people that don't have any, they don't have any, they don't feel at all. Sometimes I find the ones that are emotionally charged, they are the ones, even if they are very angry and very, uh, sometimes very wrong and evil, but they're because they're emotionally charged and they have a lot of potential, they have fire in them. And we need to recognize that even a child that's called a rasha, which we don't call that, that we don't call the child that, but even a child that's understood as that way is uh, has a lot of potential. Why is he on the table? Why is he even on the table? If he's a wicked child, why don't we tell him, "Don't be here, leave." You're a rebellious child that doesn't want to talk, doesn't want to listen, doesn't you're causing harm. Why are you here? Do you know what the answer is? Good. We welcome everyone. Exactly. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. No matter where you are and where a child is, no matter how far they've gone, if that's your child, you do not kick him out of your home. And that is a very important message. The only time that we learn and we know that you are is by Yishmael, the son of Abraham who didn't at first want to kick his child out of the house, but he had to because he was under the consideration of a Rodef, which is what we spoke about yesterday, as a person that's trying to kill somebody. He was trying to kill Isaac, their child. And because he was dangerous physically, they had the right to kill him. Okay, there's so much more wisdom here. Maybe we could continue some of this, but I have to cut it short because uh, we have... Um, uh, a class from Shira right now. It, it, you know, there's another point here. There's four types of children. Why don't we have one answer for all kids? Because they learn differently. Every child, every child has to be educated according to their way, the way that they speak. Each child needs to be answered in their way. You can't say all children are the same. We all are equal. Every child is different and they need to be recognized as different. So that's another idea. And it says, The way that you know that you've educated your child well is when you get old, when that child gets old, when he becomes an older, older adult, 
and he's not under your control anymore, he's not under your education anymore, responsibility, so he sticks to that path that you gave him back then. Then you know you've educated. The goal of education is that you get to a point where the child is able to do the stuff that you want, even when you're not around. Gam ki is keen when he's old, when your parents are not around you anymore, when the child's alone, when the child's not with their parents. I know a parent is successful with educating a child if behind the doors, when the parent is still not around, the child's still thinking of them. Then I know that there's a real special relationship. Anyway, so that's uh, some of the ideas. I hope uh, we can continue. Maybe we'll do some more on Thursday night as well. Um, but for now, we have a uh, Tehillim class for girls with Shira. Uh, it's been fun. Guys, call me. Peeps, call me. I call you. You call me. We'll have a good time. I miss you all. And uh, uh, enjoy. And enjoy the Haggadah. Remember, we have this Haggadah, which is literally catered to people that want to have uh, a real learning experience in the Haggadah in the night of Passover, we are giving out these Haggadot, and uh, they cost $5 each. We actually bought a whole bunch more, and we're gonna just be giving them out, okay? We'll speak about that later on. Um, but but for now, uh, stay tuned, stay with us. Aish lit forever. Uh, stay lit, stay happy, and we'll speak soon, we'll be in touch, okay. Thanks, bye. Rabbi. Bye, Rabbi, thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Take care, take care. See you guys. Hey.